Go on with uh, some of these statements on does God repent. Uh, notice again, Erickson stuff. What seems to be God changing his mind is a new stage in the working of his plan. But it's not really a change of his mind. It's simply him continuing his work in a way that maybe we didn't anticipate. Cook said these passages should be viewed as ways of acknowledging God's personhood rather than as indications of his finitude or humanness. Now, veracity, the word veracity deals with truthfulness. Intellectual attributes, then, definition God is the only God of reality. Now, notice these three categories truth, truthfulness, and faithfulness. Truth is what he discloses will not deviate from actuality. In other words, if God says that the world will end, you know, in a certain way, it's going to end in that way. If God said his son was going to come and die, I mean, it's going to happen. What God says will, in fact, happen. It's true. Truthfulness is God is perfectly reliable. When God says it, that settles it. Just be a bumper sticker like that. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. I believe it. That settles it. Yeah, that's the last statement. That's it. Now, of course, we have to be sure that God said it. Mm -hmm. And so it's important for us not to read scriptures out of context, but that's important. Faithfulness is that God fulfills his promises. The only thing I would encourage you to do is not take every promise as yours. I know they have the song, every promise in the book is mine, every chapter, every verse, every line. And, and the point of it is that's not a true statement. Every promise is not mine. Some are mine and some are not mine. And you've got to be sure which ones you're claiming. Uh, for example, I don't think God has promised a single square inch of the Holy Land is mine. That's not mine. That's not my promise. I do have promises, though, I think, but I just have to be sure I know what I'm talking about. Now, let's look at a couple passages in 1 Corinthians chapter um, chapter 8 here, verses 4 through 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. <clears throat> Therefore, let me sure I got the right one. Therefore, as eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. I mean, people call on gods, but they're not. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven and earth, as indeed are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, for whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. And so... Uh, for Paul, though, the Father and the Son are one God, but he has distinguished God the Father from Jesus the Lord. The Father is also Lord, <laughs> you realize. And the Son is also God, but there's only one God. Now, uh, while we're in the New Testament, Hebrews 6.18, only one God of reality. That's the truth, see. 6.18, says, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. God doesn't lie. Now it probably wouldn't hurt us here to say something that is misunderstood. I had something recently in a sermon that somebody really misunderstood me. And I wasn't a sermon in Sunday school class a year or two ago. And I made a statement that Jesus did not reveal all the truth about himself to the people on the road to Damascus. And from that came that Wayne House teaches that Jesus is a sinner and he lies. It's very important not to infer something that a person doesn't mean because you simply don't understand enough about a question. But people sometimes think they know it all, so whatever. Uh, the fact is that Jesus did disclose himself from them. The text says it. He kept them from recognizing him. It says that. What are they going to conclude from it? Or when Jesus did the parables, at one point where the parable says, he spoke to them in parables so they would not understand. 
What is that concealing or not saying all that could be said? I don't think it's deceptive in the sense that he's not trying to give them false information to draw a wrong conclusion. You see what I'm saying? He's not trying to force them to draw a wrong conclusion from the information. It's simply he's not going to tell them all the information to draw any conclusion. The Bible says in the Old Testament that the hidden things are to God alone and the remainder he gives to the prophets. Deuteronomy 18. It also says it's the glory of God to conceal things and the honor of kings to seek them out. Seek them out. So there's a lot about God and his will and his world that he has not told us. The fact that he conceals part of the truth, that which is true, does not mean that's lying. Unless you just want to start defining things that way. I think God lies. I don't think God has sinned. I don't think God tells falsehoods. I think what it does is he just chooses not to say everything he could say. And some people think it may be because people blab too much. Some people think you have to say everything that could be said or you're not saying what you should say. I mean, you know, some people just mouths just go like that. And they just have to say everything that could be said. They never make good, uh, you know, uh, spies. <laughs> you don't need to say everything. You say what's necessary for what you're doing. Jesus kept them from recognizing him, and at a certain point he appeared and demonstrated who he was. But all the time that he knows him, what is that? It's concerning. So you don't have to say all the truth that could be said, to be honest. People don't all deserve all the truth. Any questions on that? Okay, let's look at these two Old Testament passages. Numbers 23.19. 23.19 says, God is not man that he should lie. You saw that one ago. Lamentations 3.23, 22 and 23. Lamentations, not a book we go too often. Pass our oath if you're not careful. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 23, says, The steadfast love of Yahweh never ceases. Am I reading that one? 322. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. There it is. Great is your faithfulness. Oh, God. I hear something. Mm -hmm. And uh, here it is. God's faithful. Yahweh is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. That's great. So God is faithful, God is truthful, God doesn't lie. That's important. Veracity. So the implications of this is disclosure is dependable. What he says, I can believe it. He cannot lie, therefore his declarations are trustworthy. I can know this, folks. I believe that Jesus is my Savior. I'm going to be in eternity with God, and I can know that because God's trustworthy. That's it. I don't know that because I feel saved. I know people, you know, I, I just feel saved. Really, I do. What about when you don't? I mean, is that, you're, you're unsaved when you don't feel saved? I mean, you know, when you're sort of dull and despondent and discouraged, you don't feel saved, you become unsaved at that point? Salvation is not something I feel as such. I'm not saying we don't have a feeling. I'm just saying, sure, we have a testimony of the Spirit and those things, but, but that's not what I hold on to. You know what I hold on to? God's trustworthy. He's, he's truthful. He's faithful. Uh, boy, I hope it doesn't depend on me. <laughs> he's sad. Deliver us from despair of our unfaithfulness and failure. His promises to me cannot fail. He'll come through even if we don't. He'll prove faithful even if we're unfaithful. Sweet. Oh. I'll pass by those since you were having trouble with <clears throat> now, wisdom. Uh, 9.30. Yeah. Hang in. 9.30. Wisdom, omnispatience. Sapience. <laughs> sapience. <laughs> no, I didn't uh, Sapient is, is referring to wisdom. Sapiential kind of things are from the wisdom literature. So, omnisapience. Uh, definition, he sees all things in their proper perspective. Thus, he does not give anything a higher or lower value than what it ought to have. What is wisdom now? Wisdom itself. Uh, 
It's a proper application of knowledge. It's knowing how to take the knowledge and use it appropriately for the situation at hand. By the way, that's how the, uh, the Proverbs work. The wise person in the Proverbs is a person who knows how to take the given Proverbs and use them at the appropriate time. Wisdom then, God knows how to, to properly apply knowledge to situations. I well, like that. How 2 Timothy 3, 17 says that we be adequate and equipped for every good work. Because I think the clip is probably talking about beforehand rather than sort of at the moment. Or like I don't think like we should use it as like, you know, you face a problem and all of a sudden, you know, try to see if I want to say it. But if you're equipped when the problem comes, you'll be ready for it. Yeah. yeah it's, it's very hard to come up with something instantaneously when you need it if you haven't already done any preparation. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Uh, 1133 says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Proverbs 8, obviously the whole Proverbs about wisdom has built your house and talks about Yahweh there as a, a, a wisdom as a personification of Yahweh. Psalm 19, you want to look at that one? Psalm 19, 1 through 7. <clears throat> to the, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies above proclaim his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their measuring line goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world, and them he has set for a tent for his son, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man wound, uh, runs his course with joy. I thought we were going to set up. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, its serpent to the end of them, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. The law of Yahweh is perfect, reviving the soul. Testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. And so, uh, again, God's wisdom. So what does this indicate? That uh, God has a knowledge of me, which will be used appropriately. He knows how to do what I need to do. He, he, he responds to me in the proper way. I may sometimes think, you know, God, I didn't get exactly what I thought, or I think it ought to be different. We may have those thoughts, unfortunately. But actually what happens is what should have happened. For my, all things work together for the good of those that love God. The point of it is it may not be that everything is good. <laughs> that is, being in a car accident is not a good. But it can certainly be that which brings together for the good. The Bible says, and everything give thanks doesn't mean that, 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 that everything is, is, uh, is wonderful. I mean, uh, dying, let's say, in a, in a, in a, in a in some kind of tragic situation is, is, is not a wonderful thought. I mean, God, I'm thankful I'm dying. It's the fact that I can be thankful in the midst of it all. No matter how things go, we can, we can have trust that God's wisdom is, is prevailing. He allows those experiences in our life that will best conform to the image of God and most perfectly glorify Himself. Nothing comes into our life that ultimately is not somehow usable for God's glory. Uh, a couple things here. Wisdom looks to the practical rather than the theoretical side of the intellect. Practical. Can we read that? I don't God will properly evaluate every event and person and give appropriate value and attention to each thing in person. And his wisdom leads God to bring to him ultimately the greatest glory out of all events and persons in his creation. It's about God, it's not about it. everything to the glory of God, not us. Goodness. Goodness. By the way, a lot of our terminology is built on theology that we don't even think about anymore. When people say, thank goodness, historically that related to thanking God. Thank goodness. Oh, goodness. God is goodness. Like people say, thank heaven. And they're not talking about the stars in the sky. I think, at least unless you're an astrologer, I guess. Uh, 
these are oftentimes euphemisms for God. Thank providence. I don't know, I haven't even heard that. I use that term. A lot of our terms we use uh, ultimately used to be uh, even even the word um, what is that? Goodbye. You know what that used to be? God be with you. God be with you. Yeah. What about good morning? I don't know about that. I can't figure that out. Maybe God's morning. Yeah. But good morning uh, ultimately is uh, is God be with ye, plural. Goodbye. It used to be that, that the word good and God were basically spelled the same way. That's why you get the word gospel from God spell. God spell. They left the D out and came to gospel, which means uh, God spell ultimately was good news. God and good spell the same. So that doesn't mean God news, that means good news. G-O-D. Okay. Uh, goodness. God is the source of all in the universe that is good. And out of that comes three things I'm listening here. Benevolence, love, and grace. Now what I'm saying here is that you have sort of primary and secondary actings of attributes. Have you seen that so far? The point of it is, goodness is the essential attribute of God that works its way out into things like love and grace and so forth. Uh, benevolence secures the welfare of God's creatures. Love, that by which God is eternally moved to self-communication. And last, grace is undeserved favor, which issues from a genuine love and tempered by justice and holiness. Grace keeps things in balance here. God is... God comes to us who do not deserve to receive favor, but does not give us favor without counterbalancing it with something that provides the satisfaction for the justice. And of course, that's Jesus. God can't just look at sin and say, you know, I realize everybody's human. Because he's not. <laughs> and I believe everybody makes mistakes. There's no perfect standard, not even me. You know, that's not where God. God is perfect standard. God is, doesn't make mistakes. God is a standard by which all things are evaluated. So, when God looks at sin, he can't just simply overlook it and say, well, you know, we'll just let it go this time. God, to be God, has to deal with sin. At the same time, God has goodness and love and grace where he finds a way to deal with sin. At the same time, he offers to us his favor. And that's what grace is. And these passages, obviously, we can look at. But implications, God is indiscriminate in showing common courtesies and provision of life and benevolence. Let's look at a couple of passages on that. Psalm 145. Psalm 145, 9 and 15 through 16. Yahweh is good to all. His mercy is over all that he has made. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. So again, showing the fact that God shows great provisions for people, for creatures. Not even just people. Even birds of the air get taken care of. Love, 1 John 4, 3. It says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them for... That couldn't be it. Oh, wrong one. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. What's the this in there? Have I got the right passage? First John 4, 3, and 16. First John 4, 3. That doesn't seem right. 16. Well, 16 is okay, isn't it? But 3 doesn't seem right. I don't, I'm not sure why I have it. Anyway, 16, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God is for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in Him. Four seven. That sort of makes more sense, doesn't it? I think that's a typo. Okay, I think four, yeah, and four eight says God is love. Yeah, because four three just doesn't make sense there. That must be a typo. It probably should be a four seven and eight some person there. Okay, last is grace. We'll take a look at that passage. Romans 5 8.
So it says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's a great, great passage. Yeah, that's a passage that makes a lot of very strong preaching. Right? In Ephesians 2 8, well known, for by grace are you saved through faith, and this is not out of you, it's out of God. Not of works as any man should boast. So, um, the issue of grace. So, the implications then, God is in the scriptures where he said, because he is loved by nature, external circumstances do not affect the way he loves. By the way, what attribute of God does all also relate to? Justice. Well? Oh, uh, simplicity. No. There you go. Uh, let's see. Yeah. yeah. Impassibility, yeah. right. External circumstances don't affect the way that God deals with it. God does what is right to do. Nothing comes against God and sort of alters what he should do. He does what is right based on what is consistent with what he is. He's not a fickle deity. He doesn't fluctuate based on circumstances. That's what we mean by impassibility. Now, because of grace in God, we have grace from God. And uh, these are, we've seen many passages. I think I'll just keep going based on the time. Uh, goodness continued now. We've already seen grace, undeserved favor. <clears throat> Mercy. God's goodness is exercised on behalf of the need of his creatures. I think I have somewhere written down here. Let me see if I have that here. Uh, I have a good, clear definition of mercy and grace and distinction. Let me see if I have it. Oh, here it is. I don't have this on the overhead, but I'll give it to you when you can write it down. Now, maybe I can just put it on the board. Maybe that'd be good. I'll put it in the Contrast of mercy and grace. Here we go. I'll give you a little chart. So mercy is here, and grace is here. And we're going to see some differences here. Okay. Sin, mercy, and grace as it relates to the question of sin. Mercy and grace as it relates to the condition. The person and the need. So, man as bearing the consequence. Of sin. That's man as man as viewed bearing the consequence of sin. Grace is man is seen under the guilt of sin. Different issue. So when we discuss mercy and grace, when we talk about mercy, as we see how it works out, it's relating to the consequence of sin. Something happened as a result. Where this is dealing with the guilt question. Okay? Now the condition of mercy and grace, man is, and under this question of, of mercy, is pitiable. Pitiable, okay? Pitiable. Whereas here, man is guilty. Again, we relate. Consequence of sin. Person has a wreck. Arm is cut off. Bloody everywhere. Now they don't have an arm. You know, and so forth. Consequence of sin. We're looking at a person in a, in a, in a, in a, from a standpoint of pity. Whereas the issue of they were drinking while they were driving, they, they're the ones that are the fault for the crime or whatever occurs, they're guilty for what happened. It relates to a guilt issue, not to the consequent issue. You with me so far? The need of mercy is divine help. The issue of grace is divine forgiveness. So mercy relates to receiving help from God because of consequences that come from sin. Whereas grace relates to forgiveness of God based on the fact that there's guilt of sin. They relate. 
Put them out there, son. That uh, makes sense to you? Or? Easier to deal with than questions that uh, we dealt with tonight and some other issues? <laughs> You got that down, Mark? <coughs> All right. Good stuff. Now, issues uh, of mercy. He is sensitive to my afflictions and provides that measure of comfort needed in each situation. See, grace is not the question of comfort. It's not the question of sensitivity on God's part. It, it doesn't deal with some of the emotional strains of it. See, it's undeserved favor. God says, I have favor on you because of what's in me? No. What's in God? What undeserved favor? God is, decides to favor me in spite of the fact that I don't deserve it. Pity is God looks at me and says, you know, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to comfort you because you're in problems. You're in trouble. Long-suffering is God's goodness in bearing with evil in spite of ongoing disobedience. Long suffering is when God lets us continue to live when we ought to be zapped. We should all be thankful for God's long suffering. Otherwise, we'd all just be killed right up front and we wouldn't have to worry about living. Long suffering is God saying, I'll put up with you for a while. See if you can't get things turned around. With. God does not compromise with sin, allowing some kind of indulgence. God does not overlook sin, but simply looks beyond it. Now, we know this to be the case. It probably should take a moment to look at a couple of these passages here. Uh, mercy, 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Of course, Psalm 86.5. Some of you guys are using Logos, aren't you, or something? East word. East word. A what? The East word. It's, it's East, East something, something that gets you to verses fast, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here I'm still doing sword drill. Okay. <laughs> uh, Psalm 86.5. That's pretty neat. I know you put the auto power PC in there. Mm -hmm. uh, 86.5. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. And so God is merciful. Long suffering. Uh, boy, several passages in that. Uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Long suffering. Puts up with us. Several texts that come out and say that. But are, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? By the way, remember what Jesus said? He brings the rain on the just and the unjust. Wouldn't it be interesting? Uh, you'd think it'd be more helpful if, you know, you could... If your crops need rain and it only rains on the, on the Christians. And all the non-Christians don't get any rain. Don't you think that sort of indicates that, oh my goodness, I ought to be a Christian where I'll get rain? You think that would cause people to become Christians? No. No? No? They just curse God more. Yeah, even cause Pharaoh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, they just curse God more. They say, yeah, that's how God is. He plays favorites. <laughs> By the way, he does. I know there's I know some people want to quote the passage in this. There's no partiality with God, and they need to read some context, because there is. Depends on what you're talking about. But uh, certainly his children uh, get special attention. Uh, you can love everybody, by the way, and not love everybody the same. You know what I mean? You can love enemies and love your family, but I guarantee you, you probably don't love the enemy in the same way you love your family. But, you know, love is, can be loved in different ways, and I think God's the same way. Uh, 922, since we're in Romans, let's go ahead and turn over there too, I guess. 922 says, What if God desiring to show his wrath and make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? 1 Peter 
says, Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. So patience, long suffering. And in 2 Peter 3.15 says, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. Patience. God is patient, long suffering. That's what that's referred to. <coughs> Joel 2.13 is really good on that. What does that say? Um, yeah, I'll get back to it. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Uh, uh, yeah, rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord for your God, or to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and, ab and abounding in steadfast love. Yeah. And he relents over disaster. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Uh, holiness. Now, I had a professor in seminary, a man I dearly loved, a great man. As a matter of fact, one of my volumes of systematic theology will be dedicated to him. But uh, here's an area I'm afraid I have to depart from my professor. Um, he used to argue that holiness was the, was the major attribute of God. All other attributes, in a sense, related to holiness. And I've come to believe, though, that you really cannot distinguish one attribute above all other attributes in God because they all operate in concert. I don't accentuate a particular one over against all others. I think they're all over. <clears throat> but this is a certainly an important attribute. Definition, God is separate from and absolutely transcendent over all else. So we use the word holiness to think of morals. And I'm not saying it doesn't relate to morals. But that's only an aspect. That's holiness as it relates to ethics, not holiness as it relates to other issues. See, God is separate from and absolutely transcendent over all else. He's separate from moral evil and ethically perfect. His holiness in reference to morality is somewhat resultive. He was unique from the beginning. Even when there was no sin, he was unique. He's holy. His majesty raises him into a realm apart and should evoke in me a most reverential awe and profound worship. Uh, my, uh, my son, when he was a teenager, used to always be saying, man, that's awesome. You know, awesome. And I said, there's nothing awesome but God. Or the word awful, even, is a proper term, full of awe. You're full of awe. And we, it's going to become a negative term with us, but it was not intended to be a negative term. It was a term of, of, of reverence and fear of God. God is, we're full of awe of God. And God is awesome. And he's the only one that's awesome. Uh, consequently, he expects my ways to be pure and apart from wickedness. Since God is holy, that is, he's separate from evil, he's separate from those things that are, that are improper, then I should also be the same. According to, uh, according to what Scripture says. Of course, Jesus says, Be holy, for I am holy. This comes out of Leviticus. Be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, he doesn't mean that we're to be a perfect being with attributes. He's not talking about perfection of the attributes and essence of deity. Our, our actions should be, be uh, complete and whole. They should be, they should be actions that, that are consistent with God. Um, Righteousness now uh, is an attribute that somewhat relates to holiness, uh, but it relates to not so much being the question of purity as a question of conformity to what is right. To be righteous is to conform to what is right. Joseph, for example, in reference to Mary, it says was a righteous man, a just man. Just and righteous is the same term in Greek. Okay? They're not different terms. We sometimes use them differently. But justice and righteousness are the same. Just and righteous are the same. Same Greek word. Same Hebrew. I mean, we, we just use it. Here. To be right or to be just is to conform to what is right. What is what you should do over against what you shouldn't do. Yes. Um, I was just uh, about back to about holiness. Um, Charmer. Uh, Stephen Charmer. Yeah. Right. I was reading his. Uh, Existence attributes God mm -hmm. and on holiness, and uh, uh, he was saying, and I, I think that he had a pretty good, a good point 
that uh, he, he wasn't saying that necessarily that all of the other attributes of God revolve around holiness, but that in the Bible, the holiness of God is the one aspect that is most often um, emphasized when when the when people come into God's presence, um, like in Revelation, the, the angels are singing of His holiness, and Isaiah six and all that kind of stuff. So it's, I mean, would it not be fair to say that there's there is something special about the attribute of holiness? Well, I, I guess you could say there's something special about the attribute of holiness in reference to certain situations. Mm-hmm. I think you're given the situation when you come to the presence of God. Quite honestly, and I, I don't. I know people may differ with me on this, but the primary issue you'll be dealing with in coming to the presence of God is holiness, not love. Right. Right. I mean, the people yeah. don't, like, when you go to the presence of God, they don't say, um, you know, and they're omnipresent, omnipresent, omnipresent. It's the Lord God. Of, you know, they say, holy, holy, holy. Because that, that relates to how we relate to God, right. probably is what he's saying there. Uh, and, and some of these other attributes don't don't seem to take on the same significance in reference to us. Right. If to God, there's no distinction, I don't think, as far as which one is more important. But you're right, I think, when you come into God's presence, His holiness becomes pre- paramount. Well, that's why I'm saying even His love. I know some people who think God is love, and they think that, that, that's, that's all they talk about, God is love. Because that means God will let me get by with anything I do. That's why they talk about God as love, because they, they realize the fact they blow it, and they, and they oftentimes want to blow it, and they oftentimes want to do what they want to do. They always know no matter what they do, God's going to love them. So it becomes an excuse. They don't want to talk about God's holiness and justice and righteousness. My goodness, that uh, seems judgmental to me. And, of course, nobody has a right to judge another person. But they God. I mean, that's how it's looked at. Well, we don't have a right to judge another person. That when we use the Bible to, to no, I'm talking about God judging. And then that's I'm not judging. talking about even right. us judging. And when, when they say nobody, they include God in that list. Right. And that's what I'm speaking of. That's why they don't want to hear about God's righteousness or holiness because that makes them seem like they're in the, in the wrong. Mm-hmm. Or maybe they're sinful or something. You know? Let's not get judgmental. See, I may not judge a person very well, but God has plenty of judgment. And so... Holiness and righteousness are, that's aspects about him in which when I come into that presence, I find myself to be inadequate. And I suppose that's the reason why. But so I, I think that's why you don't have the angels and even the heavenly hosts saying, hope, they don't say love, 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 you know. Mm-hmm. And, and, and although love is extremely important, you know, it's because of love that he saved us. But when I enter the presence of God, I'll not be thinking about his love as much as I'll be thinking about I'm in a bad, you know, I'm in a really, really uh, unique situation here with someone that's far more than I can even appreciate. And so I think in that sense it's true. I, I appreciate what you're saying, and I think it's probably true. Uh, but I don't think it's more integral as a as a character in reference to God internally. Right. And I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. And, and that's what my professor would argue. But right. I don't think it's I don't think it's the, the attribute of the hub of God's character. Uh, I think it is equal to the other attributes in God, which are all, all the attributes are one in a sense. You know, they're all make up the essence of deity. And attributes are the way in which the, the essence of deity are expressed. So uh, anyway, thank you for that, that feedback. Uh, anyway, what we have here is conforming to a standard, strict adherence to the law, as it relates to God, the standard is a law of its own nature. <clears throat> Some people say, well, listen, is... Does God have a standard to which he asks us to conform and to which he himself conforms? In other words, is it wrong to lie because lying is wrong and so God conforms to that law? Or is it lying because that reflects what God is? That's it for that there is no external to God to which he conforms. He conforms to who he is. Lying is wrong, not because God says it's wrong, for example. It's wrong because it is wrong, because it's inconsistent with him. So what I'm trying to say here is not a, there's not a standard outside of God to which he conforms. Sort of an abstract. The standard is within God himself. 
So if, if God were different, like if, if God if God were a liar, would that, it be right to lie? Yeah, <laughs> that's the point. If God were a liar, would it be right to lie? And that's and you really can't even use those. That's like saying, if God didn't exist, would there be no God? Well, well yeah. I mean, this, but is there a possibility that God not exist? No. If He's a necessary being, He must exist. If He's if He's a righteous being, He must not lie. I mean, the reason why lying is wrong is because God is not a liar. But what if? And what? He can't be. And, and there's no possibility He could be a liar. But if He was a liar, it would be right and moral to lie. To lie. I mean, because I mean, if God remains perfect. I mean, I'm not saying that he ever But if he were perfect, he would be a liar. Well, it's, it's, it's the problem with... No, 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 seriously, I know what you're, I know what you're saying, and I'm not going to yeah, give into it, though. Right. See, I know what I could say. I, I could, I, you know, what you want me to say, well, if God did lie, then obviously that would be consistent with his nature, and then thus lying would be okay. But lying, first of all, is is inimical to the concept of truth. God couldn't have any truth. Most God couldn't be trustworthy. And there's a lot of implications of that. But it's the kind of problem we're dealing with here. If I were God, I'd do such and such. And I've already told you. No, if you were God, you'd do what God does, which is different from what you would do, supposedly, if you were God. But that's such a hypothetical that you, you would not do differently than God if you were God, because if you were God, you would be acting consistent with your nature and do what God does. And so these become, I understand what you're saying, but it... it I don't think there is the possibility that God could lie, or even that be part of his nature. It's an impossibility for lying to be part of God's nature. Right. Because God is the way he is. But if, if there were, you know, an, another existence where where there were a, a, was an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, you know, or, you know, all that all omnipresent evil deity. God who was evil, would would then it be right to be evil? I mean, because that's the Hindus. They have a, I know. you know, Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom. It's like a... I know. I know. Kali. Yeah. Kali. Kali Ma. And, 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 and the thing is, uh, <laughs> scared me. evilness is inimical to what God is. Right. God cannot be evil, never could be evil, and to be evil would not to be God. It's just, it's, it's contrary to his existence. It, it makes as much sense as saying, could God cease to exist? It just is not a possibility. But, but not necessarily, because if he makes yes, it, it is. if, I, I guess I don't. I, it's an impossibility for God to be a liar. Right. It's I, impossible I for God to have evil. Except that if he, what, if he were evil, if he were what we think of as evil, then that would be good. No, he wouldn't be God. Because the only God that can exist is a God that does exist. Well, God yeah. is a necessary being. He's not an optional being. Right, but I guess, I don't know. If he's a necessary being, then he must be what he is by necessity. Or he would be a necessary being, he'd be a contingent being. If he could be anything other than what he is, he would be contingent, he would be necessary. By definition, God is a necessary being, he must be as he is. And he could not be any other way. That's the point I'm making, but that's why I'm not giving into the argument. Yeah, but that, that is a circular argument, though. What? That God is a necessary being, therefore he must be the same because otherwise it wouldn't be necessary. I mean that that's a circular argument. Now why is it a circular argument? Because you're starting from the statement that God is necessary being. So only one two options. Either God is necessary or contingent. One or two. Logic. Okay. Can't be one one or two. Okay. Well do you want to explain why he's necessary? God is a necessary being because when you when you look at the fact of God's existence what attributes go into making God what God is, mm -hmm. as he is defined, could you have a being who is a perfect being, being other than the being that we have? Because if he were other than that, he would be imperfect. But whose standard is perfection? God's, right? God is the ultimate standard by which he's right. judged. So what we know about God... So he could di what, be different and still be perfect. No, because, no, because not what we know about God to be... If that's true, if what we know about God to be is true, and God is in fact then complete and not incomplete, then he's necessary rather than contingent because he cannot be and have all the attributes that he has. In other words, he can't be optional. 
He can't choose, you know, I'll pick this one, I'll pick this one, I'll pick this one. Mm -hmm. All those things must be part of what he is, because otherwise he's imperfect. Because of his own standard. Well, yes, but God's his own standard. That's, that's my whole point. God is his own standard. But right. I think, like, if if that standard never existed in the way, because he, if he never even existed that way. In that way. If he would have existed in another way, then there would have been another standard of perfection, which he still would meet. No, because if because if there were another standard, <laughs> other than the standard is, then whatever the other standard is, it would be obviously different from the standard that it is right now. Mm -hmm. Either one of the standards is going to be imperfect then, because if you could be something other than what you are, then just, there's an imperfection involved. Well, but the perfection is based on him. <laughs> I agree. So see, like, that's my whole point. God is what he is by necessity. If he were something else, then he would be imperfect. Because if he is all that he should be, as God, if he is all he is, then he will be perfect in what he is, and if he were something else, he would be imperfect. But the, I, I, I guess, I don't know. Because I, I, I would just, I, I would think that he could be something else, and then the way he was, the way he was would then be what is perfect. Because he is, he is the standard. Like, like if, if I was black, then Grant would be black, you know? But I'm not. <laughs> no. <laughs> I might have hops, but I'm not playing. <laughs> well, I appreciate all this. We're not going to finish 9 30. Righteousness. I need to move through here a little bit. Okay, we're never going to cover this. Uh, that's all. Okay. I told you I'd let you go. I'll tell you what, next time we're going to finish off the, uh, the one that's a big issue. Let me just introduce you to it real quick. Um, down here at the bottom. Well, then we're going to get down there. I'll start there easy. God's sovereign will. Next time. No, good. Uh, sovereign will of God, the sovereign power of God, and how the things that God can do and not do and how it all relates. That should be an interesting